this kind of transparency within the copyright system itself is something that we have been recommending for some time now because we know that creates a lot of problems, right? And 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 right now this would be a problem if policymakers think or expect that machine learning developers would need to know which of their training materials are copyrightable and who are the authors, the owners, the titles of the works that they have used uh, or that they have mined to train their models. So of course they will not be able to provide this information because this information is simply not publicly available for the vast majority of works. Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Teresa Nobri. Teresa is the legal director of Comunia, an international association that advocates for policies that expand the public domain and increase access to and reuse of culture and knowledge. She's an attorney at law and is involved in policy work both at the EU level and at the international level, representing Comunia at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. So, Teresa, uh, Comunia has been active in the artificial intelligence or AI policy space for some time now. And I spotted just before summer break a blog post that you wrote with your colleague Leander Nielbock on the AI Act and what you call the quest for transparency. So could you give us the too long don't read version in less than five minutes? Uh, yes, thank you, Caroline, for uh inviting me here to discuss the blog post I wrote with uh, Leander back in uh, June. Uh, in this blog post, Leander and I tried to flesh out the recommendations from Comunia's policy paper number 15 on the use of copyrighted works as training data for generative machine learning models. So we released this paper last April when we realized that the discussions on machine learning and generative AI we're going in a direction that could undermine the political compromise that was reached in 2019 and is reflected in the copyright directive. And I mean here, the tax and other mining exceptions. So just as a reminder, these copyright exceptions allow both mining for a public interest activity, which is scientific research, and, uh, for, and also mining for other activities, including commercial activities. Um, and in this case, uh, an option is given to those creators who do not want their works to be mined uh, for commercial purposes um, to reserve those rights. So our first intention with, with the paper was to remind everyone that this legal framework provides legal certainty to machine learning training in Europe and, in our opinion, is a sensible and forward-looking approach to machine learning training. Um, anyone uh, familiar with copyright law knows that this is a groundbreaking departure from a copyright by default model because we are allowing for the first time in Europe uh, mass scale uh, commercial uses of works that are not being actively managed by their copyright owners. And these are a significant proportion of all the works that are out there on the internet. At the same time, there is this concern about the, the authors, uh, the creators uh, who want to com control the commercial exploitation of their works and it, the, the right to opt out from such commercial uses is given to those authors, in theory at least. So what we have seen in practice in, in the past year is that there's a lot of uncertainty on how to exclude works from mining in an effective way and whether such opt-outs will be respected by machine learning uh, developers. So there's no standard, there's no best practices on how to communicate the rights reservation, and machine learning developers, as we know, do not always disclose their training data, uh, nor the sources of rights reservations that they are consulting and respecting. So that's where our recommendations and our blog posts come into play. In our opinion, uh, in order to preserve this commercial text and data mining exception, two things need to happen. First, machine learning development needs to become more transparent. And second, we need clarity on how to make the opt-outs effective. So in our view, a training data transparency requirement should be introduced in the EU mm -hmm. in order to uphold the opt-out system. Uh, and this should be, of course, 
a very reasonable and very proportional uh, requirement to avoid placing this proportionate burden on machine learning uh, developers. So for instance, this means that those using publicly available data sets or those submitting data with a data trust that would ensure conditional access to the data set to confirm legal compliance with, this, uh, with the opt-outs should probably not be required to provide any other information. So I think this would probably affect uh, mostly the machine learning developers that are not disclosing anything uh, publicly. So we think for those, uh, the requirement would have the effect to, um, to require them to show at least that they have respect certain rights, certain uh, rights reservation sources. And of course, the, commercial, the commission has a crucial role to play in all of this. So in our opinion, it should lead discussions to provide guidance on how the opt-outs is supposed to work in practice. And the same with the transparency requirements. So we think that uh, the commission should discuss with stakeholders on how this requirement should be designed and what's reasonable and what's not. So I think that's it in a nutshell. Uh, that, thank you. That's that's super helpful because um, it. What I liked about your blog post is that you're not limiting yourself to highlighting legal issues. You're going into practice, and and as you said, you you've written a communa communia has written a policy paper number fifteen in the past uh, before this blog post, and in that um, paper you already highlighted that uh, the trading training data that is available uh, in online databases or that is collected, as you said, by web scraping tools, that will inevitably contain copyrighted material because copyright is something that you don't obtain by registration, but you obtain it just by being original and, and producing works, let's say. And in your policy paper, I, I like the fact that you try to highlight, you know, the TDM exceptions, their role and what was adopted, as you said, that is actually an extraordinary measure that moves away from the normal copyright um, logic uh, in the Copyright and Digital Single Market Directive. In your paper, you also state that uh, the use of copyrighted works as part of training data is exactly the type of use that was foreseen when the TDM exception was drafted. And you also mentioned that this was confirmed by the European Commission in response to a parliamentary question. So just for people that don't know, parliamentary question is where a member of the European Parliament asks a question to the Commission um, to have a confirmation or to have a clarification and where they state a response within a certain number of weeks, <laughs> to say it politely. <laughs> um, so so wh when you say this is exactly what it was intended for and you know this is great, wh what do you mean by that? Okay, so um, text and data mining, uh, TDM, um, the nickname for text and data mining, is the legal wording that the EU law decided to use to describe, and I quote, any automated analytical technique aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information which includes, but is not limited to patterns, trends, and correlations. So this is a definition that we find in Article 2 of the 2019 Copyright Directive. And machine learning training, of course, fits into it because it relies on computational resources to analyze large amounts of digital data and find patterns and make correlations between data. Besides Article 2, we also have a recital in the directive that provides context and clarifies the intention of the lawmaker. So, we have recital 80 that, uh, that does that by uh, clarifying that these exceptions are aimed to encourage innovation and provide legal certainty in the development of new applications or technologies that relied on text and data mining techniques. So for us, it's very clear that machine learning training is exactly the type of application of text and data mining that you lawmakers sought to protect. Um, but indeed, I think not, not anymore, but there was a point where I think some people had some doubts and, and it, this was the case of the member of the European Parliament, Emmanuel Marel. So we asked uh, a question to the Commission 
where he suggested the, that AI creation was benefiting from a legal vacuum and needed to be regulated by copyright law. So he was asking for a new regulation. And the commission, what, what the commission said was um, it clarified that indeed the exceptions facilitate text and data mining, including by AI developers. <clears throat> so I think the question um, was clarified then. So you're clearly in favor of transparency, and by you I mean Comunia and, 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 and you know, the, the civil society in general, I think, is pro-transparency in AI and beyond AI, actually. Um, but you also point out that when it comes to copyrighted material, um, policymakers should not forget that the copyright ecosystem itself uh, suffers from a lack of transparency. And I, I'm not sure that everyone understands that because not, not everyone is a copyright specialist. So what do you mean by um, no transparency or little transparency in the copyright ecosystem? Okay, so first let me just clarify because I think it's important when we recommended a transparency requirement, we were thinking about the general requirement for all training data and not only copyrighted works. Uh, so, I mean... We are talking about highly uh, disruptive technology with a wide set of applications that carries with it significant social, economic, political risks. Uh, so knowing more about the data that is feeding models that can generate content is essential for a variety of purposes. And that's why you have so many civil society um, representatives asking for transparency in general. But let's focus on copyright. So uh, what I meant there is that everything would be easier if there was more transparency across the copyright ecosystem itself, because, um, you know, when, when you get um, exclusive rights over something that you own, that you created, um, and then eventually transfer those rights to, uh, to a company, to a publisher, et cetera, there's no, there's no place that registers this information. There's no place that you can consult that will tell you who are the owners, who are the creators, the multiple owners, uh, the title of the work. So what we think is that if there, was pub if there were public repositories of copyrighted materials, or if collecting society organizations themselves were required to publish the data that they have on copyright owners, and they have a lot of data, uh, everything would be easier. So, and these things are this this kind of transparency within the copyright system itself is something that we have been recommending for some time now because we know that creates a lot of problems, right? And 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 right now this would be a problem if policymakers think or expect that machine learning developers would need to know which of their training materials are copyrightable and who are the authors, the owners, the titles of the works that they have used uh, or that they have mined to train their models. So of course they will not be able to provide this information because this information is simply not publicly available for the vast majority of works. And it doesn't come attached to the works. It doesn't come attached to the original work or to the copies of those works. Um, but uh, we don't think that this means that we should abandon the transparency requirement. We just need to make it more uh, reasonable and, 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 and proportional. And as I said before, there are several ways for machine learning developers to be transparent, uh, transparent about the training data, which do not require them to know anything at all about each of the materials that they use. And I think we should also not forget that from a copyright perspective, really this transparency requirement is only essential to enforce the opt-outs. So what do I mean by this? I mean that to demonstrate compliance with copyright law, machine learning developers only need to show that they have respect machine readable rights reservations. Uh, this means that they would not need to disclose more than the details that are provided by the copyright owners themselves in the opt-out information. And even that, I mean, that, even that is questionable because maybe they don't need to disclose any information other than which rights reservations sources they have complied with. So, so yes, I think that hopefully clear clarifies uh, uh, an answer to your question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really interesting that we are in that chicken and egg situation of 
giving transparency about something that's not transparent enough. Uh, and, and I hope, uh, as you mentioned, that maybe the reservation system or the opt-out system, as it is referred to, will maybe increase transparency at both ends uh, and also maybe hopefully uh, increase control of creators over their creations uh, in the future. Um, so talking about that opt-out mechanism or that reservation mechanism in, in the text and data mining uh, articles, you, Comunia is trying to see how that could work in practice. I mean, because it's very nice to have language and legislation, but that's not meaningful if it doesn't translate into uh, actionable systems, let's say, or mechanisms. So do you think, um, um, you mentioned in your papers that thanks to that reservation system, that opt-out, we are, um, the copyright directive has set in place a permissionless use by default uh, for text and data mines, uh, mining purposes. So, but you don't, you know, you just don't end your, your thinking there. You recommend in your policy paper that the European Commission should play an active role. And you said so also in your response to the first question, to encourage a fair and balanced approach to both the opt-out and the transparency issue. And, and you suggest to have a broad stakeholder dialogue. So what would that look like if the commission tomorrow said, you know, very nice, we have principles, let's make this work in practice in a way that is fair to everyone in the value chain and that actually works. Yeah, so, um... In our recommendations, um, and, and that's where, I mean, we, we think back when the TDM exception was uh, approved, I think a lot of people thought, and we also thought that uh, implementation, in the implementation uh, of the national level, we even suggested that the implementation, that the, in our recommendations for the implementation of the TDM exception at the national level, that the opt-out could be done via the robot exclusion protocol, which creates a binary mine, don't mine rule for websites. So in the meantime, we realized that this technical protocol has some significant limitations when it comes to the application, to its application in the context of uh, um, data mining for machine learning training data, because it was not designed to be used by individual works in their work, in individual authors in their works. It was designed to be used by websites. So we know that that one doesn't work, but uh, let's look at what can work. So in recent months, other protocols and tools have been developed. I mean, at the end of last year, a W3C uh, community group published the TDM uh, uh, reservation protocol, which is still directed towards web, web pages and websites, but then appeared products, the products developed by Spawning AI and Adobe's associated nonprofit uh, C2PA. And these ones are definitely more suited to individual exclusions, to machine learning training and and, and, and there's been, uh, you know, some traction, uh, especially the, the pro for the products developed by, by Spawning AI. Um, and it seems it works. Uh, and other than that, I mean, I think in the past, even more recent months, we have seen more tools coming up. So there is a growing number of tools. But uh, despite of that, it's not clear whether machine learning developers are respecting any of those uh, protocols and tools that are uh, being created. In addition, and there's some uncertainty about whether these mechanisms address all the concerns that have been raised by copyright owners. And I think one of uh, the one of the most important things that I've heard in terms of those concerns is the issue of multiple copies of the original work that exists in the digital environment. So, I mean, you have an original copy, but then that copy, uh, the original work, but then you have multiple copies in different platforms. So how can you address and make sure that the opt-out uh, applies to all of those copies that exist in different platforms? Or if someone makes an, uh, you know, uh, some sort of, uh, of uh, an alteration of the work, then you know, make sure that this still applies to that slightly altered or modified work. So I think there's questions here that need to be addressed and that the existing tools probably are not addressing or not addressing as far as we know. Um, and there's so many questions about, you know, 
the different you know what protocol to follow how to make the developers uh, respecting uh, uh, make them respect those protocols that definitely the commission needs to do something about it from our perspective so lead these technical discussions and provide guidance on how this is supposed to work in practice to end some of the uncertainty that exists among everyone, I guess, creators, copyright owners, and probably also machine learning developers. So we would say at the very least, the discussions should uh, lead to some best practices, uh, but perhaps even more than that, we don't know. Um, our suggestion is definitely that the commission starts by convening stakeholder dialogues with all relevant parties. And, and, and we think, you know, if you have everyone represented, I mean, copyright owners, machine learning developers, but also civil society, because our concerns um, are also very valid in order to protect uh, uh, users in general, um, we think that that could lead and encourage a fair and balanced approach to this, to this issue instead of trying to just, uh, uh, you know, be silent with regards to the opt-outs and, and trying to, in, with respect to the transparency requirement as we are seeing in the AI Act, to just dictate something that at the end might not work in practice. Yeah, that's our approach and our recommendation right now do something European Commission uh, that's more uh, uh, towards uh, involving everyone in, a, in in the solution to the problem. Well, I mean, it's the good news is you see a solution to the problem. So I, I think that will that will make everyone happy that there is a, a an optimistic perspective here. And I take your point that the elements or the pieces are there in legislation already. The problem is obviously like any legislative language, they are broad and not, you know, they don't go into the detail of implementation. So now people and the commission specifically should concentrate on making it work at the language that is out there and that has already been adopted. And to make it work, it should not be limited to a selected few, like only engineers or only right holders or only you know, civil society, it should be people talking together to get that um, that balance and that fairness that you mentioned in terms of, of end results. Well, let's hope that the commission is listening to you. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that um, if they do such such uh, an initiative and if they start that dialogue, uh, Comunia will be involved in it. And I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much, Caroline.